All right. And welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. So my name is uh, Michael Engel or Michael Engel, whatever you like. Uh, I'm working as a professor for systems programming uh, at Bamberg University, and so I thought I'd bring you some of the fun stuff we are working with. So, you know, combining your hobby and being paid for it is actually quite nice, and I'm trying to do this. And I thought I'd bring you something I'm currently working on. So, this is work in progress, and we have a great opportunity to actually discuss it this year because there's an anniversary. So, this is ignored, disposed of, revived four decades of Apple's first computer with a graphical user interface, Lisa or Lisa, whatever you prefer. And so, we have something to celebrate. And of course, we're in Berlin, so we have an important anniversary this year. 25 years of Lola Rent. Oh, no, no, that's the wrong one. Sorry. Of course, we have 40 years of Lisa Läuft. <laughs> yes. So, uh, it's Lisa's 40th anniversary. So, most of my students are like half that age. And they started using Windows XP as their first computer. And they cannot imagine that like 20 years before, which is probably when their parents were kids. <laughs> Right? There were computers which had graphical user interfaces, a mouse, and all that stuff they're used to today. And that's great to show it to them. Because, you know, when you do systems programming, you want to yeah, dig deeper. You want to show your students like, oh yeah, you see some effect on the high level. You want to know what's going on on the hardware. And this is impossible with modern PCs. Not even with a Raspberry Pi, because even on a Raspberry Pi, there's a lot of stuff like the GPU, which is not open, which is not documented. So you can't even start reverse engineering without putting like two years of work into it, which my students usually don't have, unfortunately. So let's talk about Apple. How did it start? You've probably all seen the videos of this new huge Apple building, which is a circle in this huge park, so a UFO. But it started very small, of course, like all Silicon Valley companies, starting from HP in this garage there, somewhere in Silicon Valley. And of course, these two guys, well, the one looks pretty similar today. This is Steve Wozniak. He's just like 70-something years old now. And the other one probably looks very different today, if we could see him, <laughs> because it's uh, Steve Jobs, and he unfortunately passed away a bit more than 10 years ago. And they started as hackers in the best and worst sense of the world, because they were hackers in the best sense of the world. They want to fiddle with technology. They want to understand how things work. And the worst thing of the world, because they funded their first electronics projects by selling so-called blue boxes, things which created a special frequency which, 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 with which you could do free long-distance calls on the American telephone system. And Steve Wozniak had some fun and phoned the Pope in Rome one day. And actually, you almost got him on the phone before uh, they noticed something's wrong. He's not Henry Kissinger. <laughs> And so they were interested in that computer stuff. So was Steve Wozniak was working for Hewlett Packard back then as an electronics engineer building pocket calculators, stuff like that. And he's an excellent electronics engineer. And then finally, affordable microprocessors came to market. Back then, you could buy an Intel microprocessor, an 8080, that cost like 400 US dollars. Nowadays, that would be like two or three thousand dollars in current uh, in current dollars. And then there a small company called Moss Technology came to a small computer fair in Western California and, and pr uh, presented the 6502 for $25. And that was affordable. So Moss bought a couple of them and built his first computer, the Apple I. If you happen to have an Apple I, I would be very interested, but I'm afraid I can't afford a quarter of a million dollars these go for in auctions today. There were like 666 of them built. And people guess like 100 up to 200 are in existence. There's one in the Heinz Nixdorf Forum in Paderborn, if you're interested. Uh, they actually managed to get it to work again, so they have a great video on YouTube. But this is distracting, because I'm telling you, want to tell you something about the Lisa. So Apple I was a moderate success, and they managed to earn enough money to build the Apple II, which is also based on the 6502, but it had great stuff like color graphics and a built-in basic interpreter and stuff like that. And this was a huge success. Not because the hardware was so great. It was okay, but it was nothing special. Everyone could have built this. Maybe not as compact as WAS did it, but 
Yeah, there were no secrets, and there were lots of Apple clones around back then. I know some students in Karlsruhe in their student dormitories built Apple clones and sold them cheaply. I think I have one of those. <laughs> and, uh, well, it gave them enough money to continue with follow-up projects. What was the success of Apple? It was software. Software that wasn't even written by Apple, but by two economics researchers. And they built the first spreadsheet called WYSIWYG. So office applications. Something Wozniak never was interested in because he wanted to play games on his computers he built, right? Uh, that was actually the thing that managed to push Apple to this big company we have today initially. And so they st thought like, oh yeah, of course, we should build some follow-up stuff. All of the computers until like the early 80s used the same 6502 CPU, so an 8-bit CPU running at 1 megahertz to 1.8 megahertz. And then the Apple II became a bit yeah, long in the tooth, so essentially something new needed to come. And electronics was rapidly developing back then, so of course they were interested in everything new that was coming out. And since they were in Silicon Valley, there were so many other great companies around, and of course engineers know each other, and there are no company limits when it comes to technology. It's just the managers think they are. <laughs> and so they knew the guys sitting a bit further away in Palo Alto, that's where Stanford University is, and they're from a, f a company called Xerox, had his, uh, its uh, central research lab. So you might know Xerox from photocopiers. That's actually the only thing that actu ever made money for that company. But they managed to fund a large research lab, and they wanted to try to invent the office of the 1980s, in the 1970s. So you might, might have heard the, well, once in my age, or uh, some of you might have heard of this vision of the paperless office. That didn't really work out, especially not for Xerox, which built copiers, right? <laughs> so they had more paper. Anyways, they funded a lot of great researchers, including people like Alan Kay. And they, in the early 70s, thought about, like, how do I make office work digital? And they built machines like this thing. This is the first machine with a graphical screen, bitmap screen, and a mouse down there, and, of course, a keyboard. And you see the computer is this big thing below here, which had a lot of PCBs here and a large 14-inch disk platter with 10 megabytes for the operating system and application. And that was, yeah, well, an innovation because they invented stuff like user interfaces. They invented using the mouse, which was built in Stanford before by Doug Engelbart a couple of years ago, uh, before that. And they continued to develop it. Now, unfortunately, Xerox management was a bit brain dead because the only thing they could do is sell copiers. They didn't know how to sell computers. So these machines were like $100,000. Nobody bought them, or nobody could afford them. But they still continued to develop that stuff for like a couple of years. So in 1979, a follow-up machine, which was much faster, uh, but very similar in principle, came out the Xerox Star. But still, this one costs more than $100,000. So nothing you would put on your secretary's desk, unless you're a very rich company. Um, and they also built other things which really other companies made money with, like Ethernet came from Xerox, laser printers were invented there. And another thing they invented was something called Smalltalk. Just a show of hands, who of you have heard of Smalltalk before? Excellent. So Smalltalk is one of the very early, one of the first two object-oriented languages, what we call today. The other one is Simula from the uh, research lab in Norway, in, uh, Norway in, in Oslo. And uh, Smalltalk was a system, really, they tried to start, like, how can we get normal people, whatever a normal person is, <laughs> to program a computer? So let's make it easier. Back then you programmed on punched cards in assembly. They thought, like, can we do it in objects in human-like language and, of course, approachable? So no command lines, but user interfaces showing graphics, little icons where you can click on, little windows you can move around the screen. So Smalltalk was developed over the course of many years at uh, Xerox Park by Alan Kay and his colleagues, and it ran on the Alto and of all, on all the successive machines. And Smalltalk, you can see here, is a system that has windows, it has bitmap fonts, so nothing you've seen in normal computers in the 1970s. And something interesting happened, um, and this is 
that a couple of Apple engineers knew a couple of people at uh, Xerox, and so they got a tour of all the innovations at Xerox Labs in 1979. So they were shown the Alto and maybe the Star already. Uh, they were shown this graphical user interface. Uh, they were also shown Ethernet and laser printing, but they didn't get why this would be relevant until a couple of years later. So the one thing that really stayed in their mind is graphical user interfaces are the way to build future computers. And you see this. So this is a small talk window, and this is just a screenshot, so that's why it looks so crumbled, of a prototype of the LISA operating system, or even the first Mac operating system. And if you look at the font, this is a very specific font that was designed for small talk. It was supposed to be easy to read. It wasn't, so they replaced it later. And the font used here is exactly the same one. So there is more than just inspiration. They really took over some ideas from small talk at Apple. So they were inspired, but of course they couldn't license the stuff. Xerox didn't license that thing. And of course, Apple would never have been able to sell a computer that costs $100,000. I mean, they're still trying today with a Mac Studio, but uh, no. <laughs> and uh, so they thought, like, can we build our own system that's cheaper? And of course, back then, the first more capable microprocessors came to market. So we had the Intel 8080. 8088 and 8086, which causes all the mess we're using today with x86 and Windows. And we had Motorola with a much more advanced CPU, the Motorola 68000. You've all heard of if you ever had an Amiga or an Atari or an early Mac, of course. These processors weren't exactly cheap, so I remember seeing an old magazine. So I was born in 1970, so 1979, I've never, at that time, I never saw a computer in my life. The first one was in 83, a Commodore 64, but anyways. So I found some old magazines, and a 68,000 processor cost around 150 German marks back then. So not exactly cheap, but much more affordable. So. The Apple II was old, Apple needed something new to sell. Even if the Apple II was selling very well, they knew they had to come up with something new because the competition was pretty strong back then. You had Commodore, you had Tandy, Radio Shack, and of course you had the IBM PC by 1981. Uh, so in 1978, two new projects at Apple started, both named after girls, Sarah, Sarah is the name of the daughter of, the, of one of the Apple II developers. He developed the Apple II successor, also as a business system, but still mostly a text-based system, but with an uh, advanced operating system intended for small business. This is what became the Apple III. So still a 6502-based machine, but advanced, more memory, 80, uh, 80, colors, uh, 80 character screen, uh, advanced operating system, nobody bought that thing. And then there was Lisa. Why is it called Lisa? Now there's a story. So if you look at the official Apple uh, explanation of why it's called Lisa, you will read somewhere it's called Local Integrated Systems Architecture. Now this is what we call a backronym. So back then Steve Jobs had uh, a daughter out of wedlock, which he never admitted back then, and this daughter was called Lisa. Actually, he didn't even pay uh, the uh, subsistence money f uh, to uh, the mother of that child, even though he was a millionaire by that time. But anyway, so uh, many people assume that actually Lisa is still because Steve Jobs' daughter was called Lisa. We will never know. We can't ask him anymore. So the idea of the Lisa was to really take it further. So you see a prototype here with a really big screen. That's one of the first Lisa prototypes. Uh, we, we have no idea where these pictures come from, but, uh, well, they showed up on BitSavers, luckily. <laughs> and this was ambitious. So they wanted to realize a low-cost version of the Xerox Alto running something with a graphical user interface. So this should be much more ambitious, more expensive, easy to use, the next generation office computer with this revolutionary, back then, graphical user interface. So here's a screenshot of the very first test drawing bitmaps. So it's a proportional font, and they took Polaroid pictures back then of their progress. And they're all on a site called folklore.org, where all the old Apple developers working on the early Lisa and Mac actually post stories, really interesting to read. So we have some documentation of the very early development. So. Uh, after a couple of years, like five years of development, with lots of changes, discussions, uh, whatever, the Lisa is born. In January 19th, on January 19th, 1983, the first model of the Lisa, the Lisa 1, was introduced. So 40 years ago and a couple of months now.
And this was able to use this great new Motorola 68000 processor running at 5 megahertz. Doesn't sound very convincing, right? But back then, this was the thing powering microcomputers used for multi-user systems on Unix. So the first Sun machine, the Sun 1, the first SGI, Silicon Graphics machine, the Iris machine, and the first Apollo workstations were all based on the same Motorola 68K processor. And they were intended to run like 10 or 20 users at the same time on terminals. And here Apple dared to use this expensive high-end CPU for a single user doing text processing. Wow. They're pretty crazy, right? And the hardware specs for that time were really great. So it had a megabyte of RAM when your standard computer came with 64 kilobytes, so 16 times as much. A bit of ROM, just a little, because most is in RAM. It had a large 12-inch screen with a very specific feature. If you look at your computer screen, you notice your pixels on your screen are usually square. So vertical size equals horizontal size. The Lisa had rectangular pixels with a ratio of 2 to 1. So pixels were twice as high as they were white. Why did they do this? Well, first it's Apple, of course. They're doing their own stuff always. But the thing is, uh, they wanted to display 80 characters on the screen in a very good readable font. So 720 pixels by 80 characters is 9 pixels per character if you have a non-proportional font, and the Lisa already had proportional fonts, so that would be nice. So why didn't they increase the vertical resolution also? Well, because there's a limit in bandwidth from the memory to your graphics. So RAMs can only deliver data, yeah, whatever, with a certain speed, and of course these old DRAMs were pretty slow. So when you increase the vertical resolution, you need to read more lines per frame, and each frame has to be displayed 60 times a second because you need a frame uh, screen refresh rate that's uh, easy on your eyes, right? So if you would have increased the vertical resolution also, then the CPU would have had no more time left over to access the memory, which is not a good idea. So that's why we have rectangular pixels on the, on the Lisa, and I just did a uh, well, uh, rule of thumb calculation like uh, Already with this monochrome resolution, we need to move two megabytes per second to our display, which is quite a lot for a machine slow as this. Now, Apple loves to do stuff on their own. So the Apple II had standard uh, floppy drive mechanisms from Seagate or from Alps with 140 kilobytes. So f uh, 35 tracks, uh, GCR encoding with variable uh, rotation rates, uh, but 140 kilobytes is not a lot when you have a megabyte of memory in your machine. So they needed something to store more data on. And they developed their own floppy drives, five and a quarter inch floppy drives, which look vaguely familiar. So this is one of the floppies called Fileware. So you see you have one slot for a read-write hat, and what the heck is the other thing? That's another slot for a read-write hat. So Triggy drives had two read-write hats, one on each side, and the idea was uh, that you could read two tracks at once with this. So you increase, you double the data rate from the floppy. Now the problem was that the Apple guys were good or great electronics engineers. They were great software engineers. They were not so great mechanical engineers, I guess. So these things were horribly unreliable. You had to readjust them like every two months and they failed ever so often. So essentially that was a big problem. These so-called Twiggy drives, because they have two of those, and Twiggy was a, a model which was very slim in the 1970s or something. Um, yeah, they were a failure. Luckily, Apple also had the idea of like storing data on disks is actually a pretty stupid idea because you can't put that much on it, so let's put a hard disk on it. And Apple again did the same thing. Now they will have built our own hard disk. Now they were a bit more intelligent here, so they bought the hard disk mechanism from Seagate, a five megabyte mechanism an ST412, the original drive. But they didn't buy the electronics from Seagate, but they thought, oh, we can do electronics. We built the electronics ourselves. And this is actually an intelligent hard disk. So compared to the regular MFM hard disk, which needed a lot of controller hardware, this was built, controlled by a, its own Z8 microcontroller inside of the program drive. And the disk was connected over an 8-bit parallel bus, which is vaguely similar to what we have in SCSI nowadays, or had later then. But again, five megabytes were horribly expensive. I think the hardest mechanism alone was like $2,000. So 
you can imagine, you have a big screen, you have a high resolution, you have an expensive CPU, you have specially designed disk drives, which nobody else uses, and you have a 5 megabyte hard disk. So essentially, this computer wasn't exactly cheap. So the introductory price for that machine was $9,995, or around $25K today. You could have bought a very nice car back then for that amount of money. So the Lisa one wasn't exactly a success. Now, luckily, uh, Apple was a bit self-critical and said, like, maybe, 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 and Steve Jobs was absolutely against this, but the, engineer wanted this, uh, the engineers wanted this, maybe we should ask someone who actually has experience in building disk drives. And there was this Japanese company called Sony, you might have heard of it. They don't only build audio equipment, no. Uh, that brought a new disk drive, uh, the first three and a half inch disk drive to market. Nowadays, of course, you all know three and a half inch disk drives, and those were the first ones. They stored uh, 80 tracks, single sided, which resulted in 400 kilobytes of capacity. So much less than the Twiggy drives, which had 860 kilobytes, and we had two of them. But since you had a hard disk, it didn't matter so much. And these drives are pretty reliable. Uh, back then, at least. Nowadays, they're pretty unreliable. Unfortunately, I'm trying to fix one at the moment. Uh, and the good thing is that it's the same drive that was later on used in the Mac 128 and Mac 512K, so they could buy them in larger volumes. And these worked pretty reliable. So uh, the follow-up machine was the Lisa 2. And you had two variants with a 5 megabyte profile hard disk sitting on top, like we've seen on the previous slide, and a new one with a 10 megabyte drive, and that was sitting in the place of the second disk drive here inside of the machine, which made it much smaller and easier to handle. Now, unfortunately, this so-called widget drive, the 10 megabyte drive, Apple then decided with like, oh, well, it can't hurt to try build our own hard disk again, right? And this time we're also building the mechanics. This is a horrible failure. So this thing has three V8 microcontrollers which distributedly control the read-write head, the stepper motor, the rotational motor, and the interface. And if one of them is just uh, off by a single cycle or so, your hard disk crashes. Yes, uh, luckily only in software, but later on, due to mechanical failures, so the brake mechanism in the disk was too weak to actually break a high-speed high rotating disk. Actually, most of them broke down mechanically or electronically or both. So repairing a widget is a nightmare. Luckily, there are solutions for that. Anyways, they managed to build these machines, but were still very much expensive. And Apple, of course, tried to build their own stuff in any possible way. So on the left-hand side, you see an original Xerox mouse, which has three mouse buttons. And in Smalltalk, each of these mouse buttons has a defined function. One selects, one enables you to uh, open a context menu, like the right mouse button today, and the third one actually enables you to move windows to do window manipulation and stuff like that. And Apple thought, this is too complicated for our users. They will never figure out which of the buttons does what. So what did they do? Well, they just threw away two of the mouse buttons, and this is the first Lisa mouse, which had a single mouse button. You can't go wrong with a single button, right? I mean, the later ones had zero buttons, but uh, they had a touch uh, field, so that's the thing. And also, these Lisa ball, uh, these uh, Xerox mouse, mice didn't have the usual mouse ball and the two rollers on the side, but they had two separate rollers which moved, so they were very awkward to move in a diagonal way. So Apple actually helped building and this is from the patent application, the mouse we were used to before optical mice were common, so with a rubber ball, which moved these uh, yeah, two cylindrical things on the side, and then you essentially had an LED and a phototransistor figuring out how far the mouse has moved, and this signal was directly translated and transmitted to the Lisa, which could handle it. Now, the thing is, if you look at the schematics of the Lisa, there's actually three mouse buttons supported, so they weren't too sure about it. So uh, that's one thing I need to try, to connect a three-button mouse to build one and see if, if it's actually supported. That would be interesting. Um, so this is a very special model, which was a bit, it was square, like a bit of the size of a pack of cigarettes, not that ergonomically, and so later Lisa's were actually delivered with the mouse that was also used for the first Macintosh model. So there is some crossover in hardware already, so the protocol and connector is identical, and some of you might know that Atari ST and Amiga mice also work on the same principle, so you just need a plug adapter. If you don't have an old Mac mouse, you can use an Atari ST or an Amiga mouse on these systems. 
So we already talked about the hard disks, so the profile used this uh, Apple, uh, the Seagate mechanism and the rest uh, built by Apple. Uh, it also worked on the Apple III, which was nice. Uh, this proprietary parallel interface was simple and the widget interface was just a mess because of the mechanics built by Apple. Uh, but the nice thing is, this is an Apple system that's actually easy to maintain, easy to repair, because it's based on a modular construction. So this is the back side of Elisa with the back panel removed. And you see on the right hand side here is a power supply, which is encapsulated, obviously, for safety reasons. But there's a thumb screw. So you don't even need a screwdriver to open it. You can just pull it out. It's connected using a plug-in connector on the back. So you don't need to unplug any cables or stuff like that. And then the rest of the electronics is actually on a tray. So here you see it's a baseboard with a number of slots. And you can also see it here, of course, because I brought one. So here's a baseboard. And uh, the, the, uh, yeah, different cards just plugged in. So here we see the CPU board. So this is a large slot for a 68,000 processor. In front of here would be two RAM boards. And behind the CPU board on the other side is the I.O. board. The nice thing is both have the ICs facing out, so if you need to measure something because you want to see which IC got ba went bad, you can just attach your oscilloscope and you can read what's going on, so you don't have to fiddle around on the back side of a PCB and then count the pins. Oh, is it? Is it? Oh, no, it's mirrored. Oh, I got the wrong one again. Yes. Uh, so that's pretty nice. Uh, but of course, you would expect something like this from a machine costing $10,000, because they should be serviced by like office technicians who were used to servicing typewriters or Xerox copiers or whatever. And safety was built in. So as soon as you either remove this back panel here, uh, there was a little pin that went into the power supply and it closed the micro switch. As soon as you remove the back panel, the micro switch opened and the power supply turned off. So there was no way of running a Lisa with an open back panel. Unless, of course, you shorted the switch, which was common for service technicians. And there was another one. You could also remove the front panel. There was another interlock safety switch. And it was an expandable machine. You wish you'd have that in the Mac today, right? So it had two RAM slots. Uh, usually, Lisa's came with 512K or a megabyte of RAM. And you had three can't see them here, but you can see them here. We couldn't get the connectors so far because they're very strange and rare. Uh, three expansion slots for stuff like more parallel interfaces for more hard disks, or a SCSI controller, or even network controllers, all sorts of stuff. Even a sound card was available back then. That was pretty nice. So, it's a machine that's approachable. And if we look closer, we see the modules again. So there's the CPU board here. We see the big 68K processor. We see two ROMs, which just contain like startup firmware that can boot from different devices and do some diagnostics. But compared to many other computers at that time, the Lisa had a memory management unit, so it could do memory relocation and protection already, which is important for stability of your software. There's a question? Um, as far as I remember, the original 68, yeah. Uh, do you have a microphone for the questions? or? Ah, that's a trick. And the trick is, before you access a page, you execute an instruction that accesses this memory location, but is recoverable, like a test instruction, test.byte. So before you know, you, uh, before you try to access a page, you really insert, and that's a compiler operation, a test instruction, which when it fails, just gives you a result which can be ignored. And then, well, then you can page in the page, because you got a, pay, got a fault, you're back in the operating system, you can page it in, and then you can continue, the test operation will fail, but you don't need the result anyways, and then you can continue with your reload and store operation. That was also used by the first Sun machines, actually, by the Sun 1, which also had a 68,000. All this stuff was fixed in the 68010, but that was not available back then when Lisa was designed. It's actually, somebody tried to put a 68010 in there, and actually it boots Lisa OS, but there's really some strange effects because the 010 also had a loop cache, uh, which meant that self-modifying code, which was sometimes used, I guess, uh, did behave a bit differently. But yes, and most Lisa stuff actually didn't use the MMU, but the original Lisa operating system used the MMU for protection because it was, but we'll come to this later, 
a, a multitasking system, which was also pretty uncommon back then. So we have an MMU and we also have the video signal generation. So somewhere there's a shift register hiding which moves the pixels to the screen and also the uh, signal generation for the dynamic RAMs. So dynamic RAMs need, uh, don't get their addresses uh, for the bits they want to address in one piece, but in two pieces. So it's essentially a matrix of memory cells, which is addressed using a row and a column address. So they're sent in two pieces, which makes the RAMs cheaper to build because you need less pins, fewer pins on the chips. And so this is usually on the RAM board, but Apple put it on the CPU board already, which means they could build RAM boards much, with much smaller connectors here. So this is one of the RAM boards. These are identical. These are 512K each, built from 64 kilobit RAMs. So it's a mass grave of DRAMs. And so they could get away with a small connector because of the, all the multiplexing already happened on the CPU. And you actually needed it because the video and the CPU needed to access to the same memory because Apple was uh, not putting a, a separate video memory on the Lisa. So they shared the memory like, well, most later machines from Apple also did, unless they invented Nubus cards. And there's some multiplexes here, we just had a look at those, which really shift between video RAM access and CPU access, which is interesting because you can look at the schematics, they're all on bit savers, and you can try to figure out, because it's all standard 74 series chips, how that stuff works. So we have uh, our CPU board here, uh, we have the memory boards already here, and then we have the I.O. board. And this I.O. board was a bit more sophisticated, actually, because the Lisa uses I.O. coprocessors. Two of them, actually. One up here is a 6504, which is a 6502, just in a 28-pin uh, housing instead of 40 pins. Uh, so it has fewer address pins and no interrupts. And uh, this handles the floppy drive. Uh, who of you have ever taken a closer look at the Apple II floppy controller by Steve Wozniak? So you might remember this was a very small controller, only consisting of six chips. Two were the, uh, one was a boot ROM for the CPU, so you could boot from floppy drives. One was another PROM with a state machine, and the rest was just some multiplexes and TTLICs. So back then the IBM floppy controller for the IBM PC was such a huge board, which had like 100 ICs on that. So Wozniak actually used a very clever software method to actually handle the data stream in real time. So the Apple II didn't use interrupts. So uh, you could just do polling of the bits as they came from the disk. So if it's 6502 executes well around uh, well a million instructions per second. And so the bits really came exactly in that speed from the floppy disk. So that the CPU was a very tight loop without any timing left over. Could read the bits, shift them over and move them into a buffer. And it that's also the reason why blocks on the Apple II are always only 256 bytes wide, because they had a counter, uh, bytes large, because they had a counter, and it's an 8-bit CPU, counting up to 512 would mean you have to handle a carry somewhere, and this would have messed your timing. Well, interesting. So, why I'm telling you stuff about the Apple II floppy controller? Because, well, Apple thought, we have a great floppy controller, why should we build another one? Let's just use the Apple II CPU, or a 6502 as a close related one, put most of the stuff from the floppy controller driver in this EEPROM, give it a kilobyte of ROM, and have this coprocessor essentially run a mini Apple II in the Apple Lisa to handle the floppy drives, and then just talk to the 68K CPU whenever it wants to read or write something from floppy. Pretty cool, isn't it? The other things here in the middle are a couple of parallel ports, so for example to connect to your hard disk or also the connection to the floppy controller and to that other chip which I'm talking about in a minute is handled by these and there's a serial chip using two serial standard RS-232 lines for modems or printers or stuff like that, but this is a Zilog uh, 8530 SCC chip which can also handle synchronous serial transfers up to a megabit using HDLC encoding, which means uh, this thing can run Apple Talk or Local Talk. So you could network a Lisa, which was great. And finally, of course, we have the backplane, which is mostly passive. I think there's a couple of resistor arrays, and there's one IC, I think, containing a couple of NOR gates to do the slot selects for the RAM. So it's modular. That's nice. We have all the circuit diagrams, which is also nice. And we'll see why this is important in a minute. So I already told you we have advanced features. So we have, interestingly, no custom ASICs used in the machine. So there's no chip which was only built for Apple. 
almost. Let's see. Uh, so most of the logic is 74 series TTL logic. You can go to Sego Electronics here in Berlin and just buy the stuff over the counter. Just reserve some time if you, if you meet the uh, boss of the company because you'll have an interesting talk with him. Uh, last time I was there, I chatted with him for three hours. <laughs> we have some uh, very large-scale large, large scale integration chips, of course, the 68,000 CPU, the parallel port chips, which the Commodore users of, of you might know from a 1541 floppy drive or from the VIC20. So these are standard 6522 VIAs and the Xilog serial chip. We have uh, two bipolar PROMs, one the same one almost as used in the Apple II floppy controller, the other one doing the video state machine for generating the video signals on time. Now the interesting thing is, without complex additional chips, they managed to build a man this memory management unit I mentioned before, which is also built using discrete components. So I brought you a piece of the Lisa CPU board schematic here, and these are essentially six chips here. These are three SRAMs. So if you know a bit of computer architecture, you know a memory management unit needs something like a TLB, a translation look aside buffer, which is a cache for the mapping entries. So you map a virtual address to a physical address. So here we have a virtual address, the 68,000 has 24 address bits here, and we want to get a different physical address out of it to be able to relocate a code and memory without rewriting the code. So hardware does it for us. And this can be done uh, by just moving a part of the address uh, into a separate RAM. And these are the RAMs here. And then the RAM contains the translation for these bits. So if you can write these RAMs, you put one address in, you get another one out. And there's a software controllable by the CPU. So essentially, uh, well, you can shift blocks around. So the blocks are 512 bytes in size, so the least significant nine bits here are unchanged. So 512 byte blocks, and the rest can be mapped. If you know modern MMUs, they enable paging using multi-level uh, paging. So you split the rest of the address in two or three pieces, and then you have a multi-level page table. And if you have a page miss on most CPUs, some hardware starts a state machine and reads the TLB entries uh, into the TLB RAM from main memory, because page tables can be huge. So you cannot afford to put them on the CPU chip. Now, there's no such thing in the Lisa. So this is all handled in software. So this is a software TLB, software-managed TLB. And, uh, well, uh, on the Lisa, it's a segment-based MMU, so it doesn't do paging, just re relocating segments by just giving you some base address, which can be added. And so the adders are the things you see here on the right. So this is the excerpt from the patent Apple got up for that MMU, and this is really how you can see it. So they're not lying to you, which is rare enough. Uh, Sun built something similar for the first Sun workstation, the Sun 1, but this was much more sophisticated than the Sun machines, and the Sun engineers actually used to make jokes about that lame Lisa MM MMU because they knew each other, of course they did. So, uh, yeah, and as already mentioned, the I.O. co-processors here were 6504, uh, which is the tiny Apple II lookalike, which handles the floppy, and then we need to handle some other I.O., namely keyboard and mouse, obviously, because we need them, and the Lisa is one of the first machines featuring a soft power mechanism. So you might know when you use the Windows 95 or 98 machine and you shut it down, what was the last thing you see? A black screen with, it's now safe to turn off your computer. Famous last words. Uh, better to turn it on again if it's running Windows. No, uh, anyways. Uh, so Lisa had soft power off so and on. So the power supply generated a 5 volt standby current that supplied a separate microcontroller, which is called a COPS 421, with standby power. This also handled the real-time clock, which is very convenient, so you had real-time on your machine. And uh, when you pushed the power button in front of the machine, well, the machine started up, but the good thing is when you pushed it again to shut it down, you didn't need to select shut down the machine now, no. The microcontroller actually instructed the 68000 to shut down, to save all the stuff to disk, you know, open buffers, open files, whatever, and then the microcontroller shut the power supply down. Great. Of course, you have stuff like that in ATX power supplies for PCs nowadays, but this is 40 years ago. So, of course, Lisa, local integrated software architecture, or Steve Jobs' daughter, whatever, uh, 
had a lot of software, and that was the other interesting part here. We've seen all the software developed at Xerox, so the Smalltalk system. Act Apple actually didn't get Smalltalk. They just thought, like, no, we're going to program in Pascal. They had UCSD Pascal on the Apple II already, which was very popular, especially for education. Well, and they thought, let's build an operating system in Pascal. The Apple II stuff was all written in assembler because running Pascal code on a 6502 is pretty slow, but a 68K was fast enough. And so they want to build something supporting their office system because they want to sell it to well, companies doing office stuff. So it's the LISA office system or LISA operating system. Um, and they, uh, well, thought like, okay, I'll need to do text processing, I need to do whatever uh, spreadsheet calculations. I need to use a little database with addresses for like serial letters and stuff like that. So we should actually enable our users to use all these things at once. So they built something which was very uncommon in PCs for regular users back then. They built a multitasking system. Of course, Unix had this because you need to support like dozens or hundreds of users, but the IBM PC and MS-DOS obviously didn't. So they implemented something called cooperative multitasking. It's an interesting question why we haven't solved this. This is still an open discussion. So cooperative multitasking means, uh, well, an application must uh, relinquish ac uh, access to the CPU, so its use of the CPU to the operating system itself. So when an application crashes or runs in an endless loop without relinquishing uh, this control of the CPU, which is called yield operation, if you ever took an operating systems course, uh, well, then your application continues to run or is crashed, but the rest of the applications won't run. Uh, the other thing uh, which is used today is so-called preemptive multitasking. Preemptive means there's a timer interrupt which ticks regularly, like every millisecond or every 10 milliseconds, depending on the machine. This interrupts the currently executing code, your application. It traps through the operating system, and then the operating system can see, okay, we're going to switch to another process, no matter what the first process which we just interrupted was doing. So preemptive multitasking is what we do today. This is in Windows terms. Windows 3.11, 95, 98 used also this cooperative multitasking. Uh, Windows NT used preemptive multitasking from the start. Uh, and of course, it was able to protect virtual memory. Uh, so we have several applications. And of course, we didn't have something like Rust back then, but Pascal allowed you to address every address in your memory. And of course, you shouldn't be allowed to overwrite neither other applications' memory. So they would actually use the MMU to protect the memory of an application against excesses of other applications. Of course, if you tried it anyways, you would get a fault and then your application would be killed because you were doing something that was not allowed. Also, file management was rather advanced. So the first Mac only had a single level, a flat file system. Uh, Lisa already had a hierarchical file management. Of course, MS-DOS also had this a couple of years later. So what were the innovations Apple actually brought to the Xerox software? The first thing is something we don't usually think about. This is the thing on top of the menu bar. Some people hate it, some people love it. Uh, now the thing is they actually tried to do some user interface research back then. And there's something in user interface research called Fitz Law. And that is how easy it is to target something on the screen with your mouse or with some pointer. And uh, Usually, when you need to position somewhere in the middle of the screen, like on the icon, you need to control your mouse very precisely on the horizontal and on the vertical axis to really hit your target. And the smaller the target is, you know, the diff more difficult it is to get it. Now, with a menu bar, the first thing you need is you push your mouse to the back, so to the upper side of the screen as far as possible, and it didn't wrap around. In Smalltalk, it wrapped around, amazingly. So it just stuck here on the top, and then you just need to move it left or right. So these menus are much faster to use, or were much faster to use in the experiments Apple did with regular users, office users, than uh, yeah, menus which are attached to a window, like in Windows, for example. So that's why they built a menu bar. Uh, the other thing which is a bit uncommon if you use Elisa is that it uses a task-oriented workflow. So essentially you didn't start an application, then open the menu and choose new document, which is a bit of a mess, right? But there are so-called stationary documents, so templates for documents, which are just inside of the file system. And you can see them here. So here's a Lisa write paper, which is a template. And if you 
double clicked on this, it created a new empty copy of that file and started your application. So this is a document-centric application uh, or environment, which is of course appropriate for an office environment because I just need a new sheet of paper with my letterhead on it. The secretary knew how to do it. And so there's a letterhead of my company uh, template and I just click on it, I get a new one which I can put my letters in. One, something that was also not very common back then is that Lisa is internationalized. So the OS and applications were localized not just to US English, but also to British English. Yes, of course, that's important if you want to sell something in the UK. But also to French, German, so my Lisa at home speaks German with me, Italian, Spanish, and some Scandinavian languages. I think it's actually all uh, three common ones, so Danish, uh, Swedish, and Norwegian. I, I don't think they built an Icelandic version and of course no Finnish version, no. <laughs> uh, that's a bit more difficult. And that's nice. Now how, the, how does the Lisa figure out it's a German Lisa? Did they build special machines for the German market? No. But they built special keyboards, of course, because every language has its own keyboard layout. So the keyboard, of course, knows which language it has. So the Lisa operating system can ask the keyboard, which language are you? And if it says, oh, I'm a German keyboard, then it switches automatically to German, even in the ROM from startup and the self-tests and everything. That's pretty cool. And something that's really interesting to see is like, the Apple engineers got a tour of Xerox Park, and they saw all the technologies, but Xerox didn't tell them all the details of how they built stuff, because, well, they wanted to sell their stuff themselves, I guess. So something you need when you build overlapping windows is so-called regions. So for example, if you have this window here, and you have a window beneath it, and you want to move this window here to the left, then something is uncovered from the document below, and you need to redraw it. And you should do it efficiently, because you don't want to redraw your complete screen, but only the affected regions. And that's what regions are called. And the guy doing this is uh, Atkinson, Bill Atkinson. He actually had an idea of how Xerox does, did it and thought, oh, that must be the way Xerox did it. And he implemented it and it was pretty fast. And then he showed it to some Xerox engineers. He said, and they said, like, oh, that's the cool stuff. We never thought of that. We're doing it much more inefficiently. So they did a lot of innovation here and a lot of stuff which was a bit accidentally, but nice. Yeah, so there were applications. So Lisa came with seven applications for the office stuff by default. It was also called the 7.7 office system. So a text uh, processor, uh, a spreadsheet, a drawing and a graph program. So putting bar graphs and stuff like that. A project management thing, you know, using Gantt diagra diagrams and things. Uh, a list manager for, for, for serial letters, mail merge and a terminal emulation because maybe you had a Unix machine sitting somewhere and you need to connect it anyways. But the only thing that didn't exist, or one of the things, was, uh, well, a compiler or something, or a programming language. So you couldn't use the original Lisa operating system, the office system, to write programs for the Lisa. Oh, uh, damn, what did I do? Well, there was a separate development OS you needed, which was called the Lisa Workshop. And this is what you see on top. No graphical user interface. And if you ever used UCSD Pascal on Apple II, it looks very familiar. Not by coincidence, to be honest. Uh, so you had to boot a completely different operating system to develop software for your Lisa, which is like a bit crazy. And since this was so complicated, there was not a lot of third-party software support. Because, you know, most of the applications were already delivered with a system. Uh, the programmers weren't used to these new paradigms with Windows and mouse, they were inexperienced, so there's some stuff that was available. Some companies built programming languages which run on Lisa OS, like BASIC, and there's also a COBOL version. It was a business machine after all. Uh, but amazingly, if you look for third-party software on the net, there's not a lot to be found, which is a bit of a shame. And it gets worse. So there's some stuff I really don't like about the Lisa, because Apple thought like, oh, all these people copying our software for the Apple II, that's not good, we need to earn money on this. So Lisa introduced a version of simple copy protection. So floppy disks were uh, delivered to the customer with a serial number of zero on the floppy disk, and as soon as you inserted the floppy disk and installed the software to hard disk, so Lisa couldn't run applications from floppies, usually, well, uh, the Lisa wrote the serial number, also its own serial number, to the disk. And whenever you tried to use this disk to install the software on the next Lisa, they checked like, oh, there's another serial number on that disk. Well, that's not my serial number, so I'm going to refuse you to install it. So that's what we see here. Like, 
Ah, yeah, the Lisa is about to make the first copy of Lisa Calc. This copy and all future copies can only be used on this Lisa. Is that really what you want? Because, of course, if the serial number matched, you could reinstall software using your floppy, but you couldn't just borrow a floppy from your neighbor because that didn't work. The serial number was very well hidden. It was stored in one of these prompts, in the video state prompt, and you could read it by actually some strange timing variants. Uh, so essentially something very similar to a channel attack nowadays. Uh, so people actually couldn't figure out for more than a decade how this worked. Well, of course, finally they did. And there's nowadays deserialization tools available, so you essentially have to change uh, for every floppy bytes at address 5A42, 3, 4, and 5, reset them to zero. Voila, you have a fresh install disk. The good thing about Lisa is well, it was an open architecture, so people knew how to program it, so there were alternative operating systems. So essentially, since we had an MMU, we could run Unix. And I said, these machines were usually, so 68K machines were usually used as multi-user Unix machines. So we could use a Lisa to run Unix. So uh, we can run Microsoft and SCO Xenix. So Microsoft built an operating system for the Lisa, right? It wasn't that popular, but yes. There was another System 3 and System 5 port by Unisoft, which were the exports in, experts in porting Unix to 68K machines. They also built the first SunOS for Sun. Uh, there was a Smalltalk 80 version finally, and this is described in one of the famous Smalltalk books which are now available online by uh, Stéphane Ducasse in, in Lille in France. Uh, he's an old Smalltalk uh, researcher, and actually Apple built a prototype Smalltalk 80 system running on the Lisa and didn't run that bad. And there was also a version of CPM, which is usually for the 80 machines. There was a 68K variant, which was also available. So here you see Smalltalk. So this is a typical Smalltalk 80 screen, which looks quite different. So you have no menu bar on top, the menu, uh, the window handles look different. But this font is familiar again, with the one we've seen in the beginning. And then of course you see, well it's a Unix machine, so it has a text screen. So this is running an emulation here. Sorry I couldn't get it to run on a real machine. And this is actually a screenshot of the Apple Lisa Unix. But this was actually connecting using a terminal, because Lisa of course had a black and white, and no green screen. So you could use it for many purposes, and the, one of the strangest purposes was actually software development for Atari. So if you know your Atari ST, it was running an operating system called GemDOS, which was closely related to CPM 68K. And back uh, on top of that, also from digital research, there was a graphical user interface called Gem. Well, this was pretty nice. This was the, the Atari ST was also co later called the Jackintosh. So Jack Tramiel, as the guy who bought, at, uh, or yeah, well, who had it Atari back then after he, he sold Commodore, <laughs> uh, well, he, he he tried to build a low-cost Mac. So uh, actually, a Mac was expensive, and Atari ST was much more affordable, and it also had a mouse, it had Windows, and stuff like that. And um, yeah, but uh, well, they needed the machine to develop that stuff on, and. For many years, it was rumors from old Atari engineers. Yes, we had Apple Lisas, but, well, yeah, they can tell me a lot, right? And then, like uh, 15 years, 25 years ago, actually, most of the gem source code was open sourced by, uh, well, Caldera, which bought Digital Research a number of years ago, uh, and its subsidiary Neo, an embedded Linux uh, distributor, actually. And uh, people took a closer look at what's actually inside all these dumped archives that they gave us. And there was like a gem development toolkit. And people figured out, wait, there's drivers for the Apple Lisa in there. And people really spent a lot of time reconstructing that stuff, compiling code on the Atari STs. So now you can get download a bootable gem disk for your Lisa. It runs, it runs perfectly, and you can run your Atari ST applications on your Lisa if you want. Only the well-behaved ones, of course, not directly accessing hardware. But it's open source, so there's yet another OS. And there's more. Now the problem is, the Mac, the original one, the 128K, came out a year after the Lisa. And these were competing groups inside of Apple with different target markets. And this was one of the reasons why they kicked out Steve Jobs a year later, because they couldn't just stand him anymore. And uh, so the Mac was a quarter of the price of the Lisa. So it was only $2,500. Of course, it was much more primitive. So it didn't have I.O. code processors. It had 128 kilobytes of RAM. It had a small 9-inch screen, but it cost a quarter of the money. So nobody bought Lisa anymore. 
So that was a problem. Apple sat on a huge stack of unsold Lisas and they had two incompatible operating systems because the Lisa OS was so complex you couldn't put it on a Mac because it would run out of memory immediately. So actually what they did is they took their Mac operating system and ported it to the Lisa so they exchanged a lot of drivers. The CPU was the same luckily and so all the remaining Lisas which was a 2.10 version, so the one with a megabyte RAM and 10 megabyte hard disks, were rebatched as Macintosh XL, the extra large Macintosh, and sold for a cheaper price. But the hardware is absolutely identical. Now the problem is, a Mac has square pixels. Elisa, as we remember, has rectangular pixels. So when you run Mac software on your Lisa, everything's squished horizontally. Your circles are ovals, your squares are rectangles. So there was a hardware modification consisting of two new firmware prompts and this video state PAL and a new transformer because something changed about the frequencies uh, to modify the Lisa to use square pixels. You could actually have that installed uh, by a field technician in your Lisa and then the resolution changed uh, from 720 by 360 to 608 by 431. Still quite a bit more than the original Macintosh which had 512 by 342. The unlucky thing is that as soon as you installed this modification, your original Lisa OS didn't work anymore because this required rectangular pixels and it didn't work with the new firmware. So Apple tried to sell the Lisa as Mac XL. It was a great tech, but uh, yeah, actually it was still expensive. Now still there were a lot of Lisas out there and there was a lot of unsold inventories of Lisas out there. So what did they do? So Apple thought like, oh yeah, well maybe somebody wants to take them, but we don't want them anymore. And there was this small company in the, I think in the northeast of the US called Sun Remarketing, nothing to do with Sun Microsystems, uh, which thought, oh, oh yeah, we'll take the Lisas off your hand for the scrap metal price. And we sell them again. So this is a Mac XL, and they sold not for $9,995, but for $995 a couple of years later. Uh, and they also built accessories to expand the Lisa. So there were accelerators with CPUs up to 18 megahertz. They had a two megabyte memory card, which finally used the first 256K SIM modules. There was an upgrade to 800K floppies, even a 20 megabyte SCSI hard disk. And they even improved this emulation of the Mac called MacWorks uh, to support newer Mac, Mac OS versions up to the last System 7 version even, which was supported on a 68K, 755. So people could use the Elisa for quite some years more, and it was not worse than a Mac Plus or a Mac SE, and they already had that machine. That was great. 7.6 7, doesn't run on a 68,000. It needs a 020. Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, well, that's great. Nowadays, we have some more useful hardware if we want to still run a Lisa. So one of the things is these floppies are mechanically unreliable after 40 years. I have one I tried getting to work. Now the mechanics work, but the electronics is broken. Thank you. <laughs> and so uh, a guy in the US with a nice website called bigmessofwires.com built a floppy emulator for all Apple hardware, for Apple IIs, for Macs, and for the Lisa. We know the floppy controller was almost identical. And this is called Floppy Emu. It's an AVR controller where you could put in an SD card. Like all the floppy controls, it's $150, so it's a bit expensive, but there's great support, and this guy is great, and it works. And this has a Lisa floppy disk emulation mode, as we see here. Uh, now, we said the hard disks were also unreliable. What could you do? Well, there's an emulator. The first one was built by Patrick Schäfer, who is an engineer at RWTH Aachen here and lives in Dortmund, where I met him because I was living in Dortmund for a couple of years. And he built the uh, IDE file, which is an 8051 microcontroller emulating this parallel protocol. And then you could just connect a regular IDE hard disk or a compact flash card nowadays to emulate your hard drive. There's also a project that tries to do it on an AVR, which is very simple up here, which you can build cheaply. It's open source on GitHub. The pr this is unfortunately not open source. Now the AVR file works with the Lisa 2.5, but not with the 2.10, because they changed a bit about the signal integrity and it's now too fast for the AVR to catch up. So there's some problem here, which is some critical timing. There's also a commercial emulator, which is like $350, called the X-Profile. And there's also replacements for this stupid I.O. controller, 
which is unobtainable. So the keyboard and mouse controller is a masked program controller, which was only built for Apple. It's a standard controller, but with a special program in there. So if you want to replace that one, well, you have a problem. And uh, luckily, these controllers can also be had with an external EEPROM. So Patrick Schäfer, again, who built the IDE file, also built that adapter here, which you can just plug in if your keyboard and mouse controller breaks, which can happen if your power supply acts up. And there's also a keyboard emulator, because these keyboards might be hard to find and are unreliable nowadays. So you can connect either an original Mac keyboard, which is much easier to find, or even a USB keyboard using an Arduino as an interface. So if you have a Lisa, what do you have to do to make it happy or to keep it happy? The first thing that's a problem is, as we said, the Lisa had a real-time clock. And a real-time clock, if the machine is really not powered, so you, plug, uh, you unplug the cable, well, it needs some sort of backup to keep the time. And this is usually done by batteries. Now, this is a nickel-cadmium battery pack. And as you know, if you're taking care of old computers, the first thing you need to do is take out the stupid battery because it tends to leak. And what it leaks is corrosive acid. So, as you see here, there's some blue regions here, there's some dirty regions here. So this is all the copper that was disintegrated by the acid from a leaking battery. And that usually destroyed your I.O. board here, with, where this was located, and it destroyed your baseboard. So your Lisa was actually broken. Then another common problem is reefer capacitors. So reefer capacitors are used to uh, stabilize the incoming voltage from, from the net. So 110 or 220 volts. And these are paper-based capacitors. So there's paper inside there, which is not that bad. But unfortunately, the plastic they encased it is very brittle after 40 years. So it tends to break. And when air comes in, they go up in a nice cloud of white smoke. This is what happened to my Lisa, because I want to turn it on on its 40th birthday, because there was this live uh, transmission from the Computer History Museum about the open sourcing. And I said it would be nice to have the Lisa running. And then well, I got some nice white smoke, and it, uh, well, stank like hell. <laughs> so that was when I need to repair my power supply in my Lisa. So that's a common problem also for very many other power supplies. Reefers tend to break. They're just crap. Sorry. Hope nobody from Reefer listens to this and sues me. The Sony floppies tend to get stuck because the grease hardens after 40 years. So you have to use a lot of WD-40 or isopropyl alcohol to ungrease them. But still, uh, the capacitors also are a problem here, as of course all the other capacitors in the system, you know, electrolytic capacitors, tend to leak also. It's not as bad as the leaking batteries, but you have to replace them. We also said the hard disks break easily and are hard to repair, especially the widgets. And the keyboard is another special case. So this keyboard actually uses capacitive sensing. So un beneath each key, there's a pad of foam, which you see here. right? And on top and on bottom of the foam, two uh, well, pieces of whatever, conductive foil, aluminum foil, or something are glued. So when you depress the key, the capacitance of this capacitor you built from this piece of foam, which is non-conductive, and the two conductive elements changes, and you can sense that a key was pressed. Pretty nice idea. You don't have mechanical components that can break. Unfortunately, of course, foam after 40 years tends to get very brittle. So to get your keyboard working again, you need to get these little foam bits. Somebody built a special metal tool to punch them out of foam again. You need to glue conductive foam on top of bottom, and you need to do this for all the 80-something keys of Elisa. Oh my goodness, I have to do this for mine, because mine is also no broken. Or you use a keyboard emulator. But you can do it. It's all manageable, because this machine is serviceable and is simple. Well, so... Lisas were sold to Sun Micro uh, Remarketing, but of course, there were more and more recent Macintosh models, so nobody bought Lisas anymore. And in 1985, uh, there were still lots of Lisas, like five to 7,000 of them in stock. Even though Sun, Micro, uh, Sun Remarketing acquired the rights to sell the Lisas, they still remained Apple's property. So they were just like a broker for the hardware. Uh, so it's a consignment. And the problem is, in 1989, the, most of the unsold leases were still on Apple's books. So they are counted as unsold inventory for tax purposes. So they're quite expensive. So Apple decided, let's get rid of the remaining ones, 2,700 ones. And so we have to write them off. So we're burning, burying them in a Utah landfill. And that's a photo of a Lisa, which just got crashed by this bulldozer there. And so they really buried 2,700 remaining machines somewhere 
in Utah. Actually, people try to find it. You may have heard the story of this ET game for the Atari 2600, which was uncovered on a landfill because it was such a horrible game that it didn't sell, and Atari buried hundreds of thousands of cartridges. These were recovered. Little Lisas are broken beyond repair because if you bulldoze a CRT, there's not much left, unfortunately. And Apple actually made a quite nice amount of money from this, so we got about $34 of tax break for every $100 of depreciated value. And of course, they said, of course, these machines were $9,995 initially. Yes. So that made them, unfortunately, quite a lot of money. It's sad. I could have used this keyboard here. <laughs> so this is the end. No, it's not. My talk is still going on. I hope I'm not running out of time because I forgot to take a clock here. Um, so is there still hope? First, if you want to run Lisa software, you don't have a real machine or your machine is broken, there's two emulators available. Uh, development started for the first one in 1979, the Lisa AM, which you'll see here. And this is a fancy emulator. So this is the screen that actually shows up. It looks like a real Lisa. You have to push this power button to power it on. And it even makes real floppy noises and the power light goes on and off. This is fun, giving you the real experience. Another one was uh, started in 2006, the Idol, because well, back then Lisa M could run the Lisa OS, but none of the alternative OSs because the emulation was incomplete. Because, well, back then, not all the documentation was available. Well, Idle uh, tried to uh, make this better, but the author was a bit more humble. It said, Idle is the incomplete draft of a Lisa emulator. Now, both are open source. Both can run Lisa OS and the MacWork XL Mac emulation now. Support for other OSs. It depends. So I had problems getting anything else to run, but I know with earlier versions stuff ran. Maybe it's a problem here on my M1 Mac nowadays with ARM and 64-bit, something like that. I need to figure it out. Uh, that's where I, where I was running out of time. And even in recent MAMES, so the multi-arcade machine emulators, there's some support for emulating ELISA, and some of that code is actually exchanged between the emulators, like peripheral emulation, which is nice. I mean, it's open source. People should collaborate. So is this the end? Well, luckily not. Um, so one interesting thing is uh, that happened earlier this year, but was uh, started a couple of years earlier, uh, before that, is that the Computer History Museum actually approached some people at Apple and said, like, now you're finally not going to earn any money more with Lysa software, right? Are you? Oh, no, probably not. Unfortunately, Apple couldn't find it. So they lost their source code until somebody found a backup tape. And that was happening like in 2000 and something, in the 2010s. So we have it, and uh, the Computer History Museum got a copy. Unfortunately, they also got a letter from Apple's lawyers like, if you publish this, we'll sue you to the ground. And it took them like five years to actually get permission to publish it. It didn't get better due to COVID, I guess. Uh, so. What they actually managed, and that was coincident with the 40th anniversary of the Lisa, which was, of course, very nice, to release the complete source code of the operating system, the Lisa OS, and all the seven Office applications. Uh, and, of course, the development toolkit, all the libraries you need to build software in source code. So it is mostly Pascal source code and, of course, a bit of pas uh, assembly code, 68K assembly. Here's just some examples. And, uh, well, unfortunately, it's not open source at least not in the common definition of open source, because there's constraints. So this is the so-called Apple academic license. So you can use it for non-commercial, academic research, educational teaching, and personal study purposes only. And there's another paragraph that says, you're only allowed to run it on your hardware. So not in the cloud. I guess I don't have a Lisa in the cloud, do I? Hmm. And if you look at the source code, of course, for, with old source code, it wasn't scrutinized as badly as modern source code for swear words and stuff. So here in one file, which is the source code implementing the main window for the preferences app, like, welcome to the all create preferences window. So with the extensive use of hallucinogens, I have found truth and beauty. However, those same hallucinogens have also made me incapable of getting to Dodge Rich to sell reclaimed ski bags in the parking lot. So they must have had some good stuff back then in California, I guess. And I encourage you, you can download it, you have to register with a name, but that's perfectly fair. And you can dig through the source code. Maybe you find some other interesting stuff. If you do, please let me know. I'm, I'm always looking for these Easter eggs. So we have the source code, which is nice. We can build our own modifications to Lisa OS. Well, the problem is you need Lisa to do this, right? And that's a good thing about it. We can do this now. So. 
uh, I said that this battery tends to leak. And if you see something like this on a PCB, so the stuff which was originally gilded copper uh, now turns into oxidized copper, like this green nasty stuff like you see on old church roofs and also and stuff like that. Well, this is due to acid leaking into there. and This usually destroys the contacts and the PCB. So this is the original battery pack, and you see this also already started leaking here somewhere. And this is just a huge mess. So people had working Lisas even in the 2020s, but with broken I.O. boards and broken main boards. So they needed a replacement, and that's where people started. There was a company even doing this called Sapient Technologies. They still sell stuff relatively expensively. And the right to uh, the products developed by Sun Remarketing, so the SCSI boards, SIM memory boards, all the extensions we've seen, were transferred to a company Vintage Micros. And they cooperated in building replacement parts for the Lisa. Unfortunately, they're pretty expensive. And now they ran out of original manufactured stuff, so it's hard to get stuff. So people start to say, well, this hardware isn't too complicated. Let's build our open source ones. I mean, we have the schematic diagrams. We have the thick pictures of the original boards. How hard can it be? Famous last words, I know. And they started last year, and actually, it's online. So you can build your own Apple Lisa now. So the, initially, the I.O. and the mainboard were recreated because those were the things broken in real Lisas. These are simple. These are two-layer boards, so just the front and back side. So you can just take a photo of an empty board and essentially redraw it in your PCB layout program. And then, of course, somebody said, like, OK, we already have an I.O. and a mainboard, so let's to a CPU board, and then we have a complete machine, right? So the CPU board is more complex at four layers. So you need something like an X-ray machine to really look inside. But, well, you can find an X-ray machine at your doctor's office, right? Um, so all of these were recreated. You can get the schematics. Uh, the CPU board is available in Altium and Easy EDA format. The I.O. And, uh, and main board, unfortunately, only has PDFs because I guess they redrew them by hand in a drawing program. And also the Germa files, so the files needed to manufacture your PCB once you send to your PCB manufacturer to have it built. And these are all available and downloadable on GitHub. The only thing missing are the memory boards, because nobody wants to solder a memory board with 128 64 kilobit chips. So we need a replacement for this, but uh, that can be done. And one of the challenges, as I said, is this microcontroller handling mouse, keyboard, and power. Uh, so this is unobtainium. You need to take it from a broken Lisa main board. Well, for people with defective I.O. boards, where well, the battery was sitting there, but it was leaking in that direction because this is just rotated 90 degrees. Maybe they were lucky and could take the working controller from their board. Maybe not. We have two of these bipolar prompts. We said the one for the floppy controller, the other one for the video and serial number. These are available. You can buy a 6309 or something similar bipolar prompt nowadays for a couple of euros. Uh, being able to program them is a bit more difficult because they need like 27 volts of program uh, voltage and most modern e actually don't support this. So you need an old one. For the memory management unit for this TLB, we need very fast static RAMs. So 1K by 4 RAMs are easily available. 2114s from your Commodore VIC20 or something would be useful, but they have an access time of like 200 to 400 nanoseconds. Uh, the MMU is in the critical path from the CPU to the RAM, so it needs to be as fast as possible. So they used 55 nanosecond RAMs. These are harder to find. I found some on eBay in Poland, and they actually sent them. They're still in ceramic cases, not even plastic cases, so pretty nice. The RAM boards have not been recreated yet, but most of the leases came with a megabyte of RAM. So if you have a working one, you can take one of the two RAM boards out, 500 k and put it in your replica to test it already. Uh, the video was very special because due to the high horizontal resolution, it had a high uh, line frequency. So the usual frequency is like 15.652 kilohertz for a TV signal. The Lisa uses like 22 kilohertz. So you need a multi-sync screen capable of doing this. Or there's a solution using a Raspberry Pi called RGB to HDMI. So an RGB signal to HDMI converter using a Raspberry Pi, uh, which can be configured to also accept Lisa signals. There's a small CPLD on it. Um, if you have a broken power supply, there's also a replacement available, building this with the standard ATX power supply parts now. Uh, but you need 33 volts to supply some voltage for the CRT, so you need to add some components. But this is also available on the uh, GitHub sites where the other boards are available. 
So yeah, and people have first prototypes working. So this one's here, you see is obviously not yet working because it's not populated, because I was running out of time. I have two boards which are populated with all the passive components and the sockets, but I haven't started testing them yet. So this will unfortunately take some time. I would have loved to take you a working clone here. So this is just uh, empty boards. Uh, but you can easily pr uh, have, uh, well, like the Chinese producers, or of course the local one, have the boards manufactured, and I had them built at JLC PCB, and the CPU board, because it's four-layer, and big cost like $12, the I.O. board was six fifty, and the backplane is a bit smaller, it was $4.50. So that's actually affordable. Uh, some other stuff is a bit more expensive, like uh, some of the components, like these specialized connectors here cost like $30 each because, well, nobody else uses them, but there's luckily still a company building them. Um, and so some of these special chips, depending on where you buy them, might, might be a bit more expensive. So if you buy a new 68,000 from Kessler Electronics, for example, it will set you back like $20 or 12, 17 euros or something like that. But it's still reasonable. Of course, somebody built it, and uh, there's a prototype in CNC cu uh, cut plexiglass with a multi-sync monitor and an adapted Mac Plus keyboard here, already running by one user, and there's on Mastodon and Twitter some other users. So we have, I think, three machines already running in the world, most in the US, and uh, the fourth one hopefully later this year. So what are we doing with this? Because I didn't build the PCBs. I didn't design anything. I was just fascinated, like, let's do this. And this came from a motivation that, you know, I'm teaching operating systems design, virtualization technology at Bamberg University. By the way, sorry for the advertisement, we're hiring. If you want to do a PhD, let me know. We have an open position fully funded. So, uh, students who took my OS course, so we start writing a small preemptive multitasking OS from scratch in C or Rust for RISC-V in my course. And these students ask me like, oh, can, can't we also do some hardware stuff? We want to do some hands-on soldering and stuff. And I thought, yes, sure, good idea. I always want to support this. And I started with, there are some other open source hardware clones, Sinclair clones from 1980s microcomputers, Sinclair ZX81 and Spectrum. And these were recreated first in the 80s and 90s in the former Eastern Bloc states. And of course, nowadays you have modern copies. And these are all also open source on GitHub, so you can download the files, have them manufactured for a couple of dollars, and you can buy, buy all the components because the Z80 is still manufactured. You can buy them for a dollar in China or for seven dollars by Ed Reichelt, for example. And the rest is TTL chips, Statigrams, and EEPROMs. So uh, we had an event um, organized by the local hackerspace in Bamberg, the Backspace, what a nice name, which is also the local chaos group in Bamberg. And they uh, organize a large three or four day event each year called the Eager, the Intergalactische Erfahrungsreise, the Intergalactic Experience Trap Trip. And I thought, let's, let's offer a workshop, a soldering workshop here. And not only my students, but also some other people came, registered, and built their own ZX81, which is a bit more simple, or the ZX Spectrum clone, which is a bit more complicated. So we need some soldering experience to build this in a reasonable amount of time. And I thought, well, that's nice, but it's not a challenge for me because my... The uh, copies I built worked on the first try. So I need something that doesn't work on the first try. So I thought, let's build a Lisa clone, right? And uh, yeah, I like Apple hardware. I have a huge collection of stuff, including an original Lisa 2, which I unfortunately couldn't take here for this meeting, um, and a couple of Nexts and stuff like that. And so I thought, yeah, that would be a cool idea. And maybe I can also use it for teaching, because this is a machine where I know every bit of hardware. I have the source code to all bits of software. So I can explain it to my students, and my students can explore stuff themselves. That would be nice. Uh, we are trying to, so, so my students build these Sinclair clones, and then they ask me, okay, can you teach us how to design a PCB? Like how to use KiCad or something. Yeah, sure, that would be interesting. So, of course, we need a project to do this. Like, maybe we could build uh, an SMD version of the Lisa, maybe fitting it into a laptop case. So we built the first portable Lisa, which doesn't weigh 20 kilos, right? In CMOS, so it uses much less power. Or we could also do an FPGA version. There's FPGA versions of the of several Macs, for example, for the Mr. FPGA uh, emulation board. Uh, what I already did is these bipolar prompts because I didn't have a programmer for these, or I do have, but I couldn't find it to be honest. Uh, I replaced these with guards, so these first uh, generation programmable chips. 
And this was fa fascinating because usually you put in your inputs and your outputs and then you let the optimization program do the optimization. When I tried to do this, it told me it won't fit. I didn't believe it. So I spent the whole night until 4 a.m. in the morning doing the optimizations by hand and I beat the machine. I could fit it. Just need to test it. But it should work. Uh, simulation is wide. We're trying to play, replace this stupid microcontroller, which is unobtainable. Uh, so this COPS microcontroller handling keyboard, mouse, and power with an AVR microcontroller. We have the source code for the code running on this COPS 421. This is just a kilobyte of code. And, uh, well, what uh, we're trying is we do a static translation. So we assume this assembler code is not assembler, but it's source code for some language, and we're translating it to AVR machine code. Unfortunately, this is a bit more complicated than it sounds, so not just replacing an instruction that uh, whatever is called load with move on the other one, uh, but it has to be timing exact, because Apple didn't use interrupts on that thing, but they used timing loops, and of course they timed even GPIO pins, uh, so the keyboard protocol and stuff using these loops. So that is a bit more of a challenge, but one of my students want to work on this, so that's a bit of research we're doing here. Uh, yeah, replacing essentially ancient, unobtainable components which you need to run and obtain with modern stuff. And of course, we're trying to develop a RAM board. Obviously not with 128 discrete RAMs because two megabytes of RAM are a single $5 chip nowadays. These are mostly static RAMs. As I told you before, the addresses are multiplexed on the RAM board, so we need to demultiplex them again to access a static RAM. But that's possible. That's easy enough. And of course, it would be nice to analyze, use and improve the Lisa hardware to analyze the OS to figure out why on earth didn't it use preemptive multitasking but just cooperative in some projects with students who want to learn about system level programming, about hardware design, hardware software interface, because that's what we're doing in my work group in Bamberg. And if you're interested, well, uh, that's almost all. I thought I'd uh, give you some visions of what people thought the Lisa future might be. So the first one here is a portrait screen, actually, and that was a design by Frog Design. So Frog Design is a design company founded by Hartmut Esslinger here in Germany, and he built some famous machines like the later Mac 2 series, starting from the Mac e, SE and Mac 2, and the Apple IIc, and also the Next Cube, for example. But he also designed the Sony Walkman. So he's one of the best industrial designers out there, or his company, and they built a prototype for Apple, like what might a future Lisa look like? Well, this was obviously never built, uh, so it's not, also not a working prototype, it's built of uh, wood and foam, but it looks pretty nice, I think. And if you know later Apples, this might be the inspiration for the portrait display, which was available for the Mac later on. So you had a full A4 page available on your screen. And there's another thing I found by an Italian designer called Antonio, is he Italian? I don't know. Sounds more Spanish, right? Antonio de Rosalisa. Uh, he thought like, oh yeah, let's combine this modern Apple alum uh, aluminum style with the old hardware. So this is the idea of, yeah, well, we don't need a CRT, just a flat screen, an LCD, right? So it's actually the whole back part of the Lisa is missing, but the rest looks pretty much the same. And I guess that was inspired by something by a German design company called Curve Labs, which took the inspiration from the original Mac and then built such an aluminum profile model here, but it's also just a mock-up. Building this in real would also be nice, but I guess we need a, an advanced CNC machine to do this. If somebody wants to donate one for our hackerspace, let me know. <laughs> okay, uh, so finally, Lisa, of course, and the Mac are related, as we've seen. Uh, the Mac, as I said, was a quarter of the price, but the hardware was significantly weaker. It had no memory protection, little RAM, no hard disk, just floppies. Uh, and it already used programmable ICs, which took a quite a long time to reverse engineer. The first one who did this in the 80s was a, a Brazilian engineer, and they actually built, they had built Apple II clones before, and they built a series of Mac clones until they were sued uh, out of existence by Apple, because Apple uh, pushed uh, the American government to actually forbid fruit import from Brazil if they continue build Mac, building Mac clones. <laughs> And so the Brazilian government for, uh, just uh, killed that company, I guess. But uh, information on that is available, so we now know how the uh, parts in the original Mac works. But the Mac Plus, there's still two un-reverse-engineered uh, uh, parts. And the problem is, well, the Mac had so little memory, you couldn't actually develop software on a Mac. You had to buy a Lisa 
to develop software for a Mac using this Lisa workshop, this primitive system in initially. So that's probably why Apple sold a number of Lisas anyways, because they were developers who wanted to write software for a Mac. So to write software for your fancy $2,500 computers, you need to invest another $10,000 plus the cost of the software, which was also not free. And some stuff is shared, like Quick Draw by Bill Atkinson, which is the these advanced graphics routines, which were fast, which were using these regions to draw windows. These were originally written for the Lisa and then easily adapted in one night to the Mac because they needed a demo for some shareholders or something like that. The source code of Quick Draw and uh, the first drawing program, Mac Paint, was published a number of years before in 2010, also by the Computer History Museum. And it's very interesting to look at. This is mostly hand optimized assembler code with a bit of Pascal intertwined. And the Mac system was much more primitive, so it was single tasking, it had a non-hierarchical file system, originally the MFS, the Mac file system, and it had large parts in ROM, so there were initially no alternative operating systems for the Mac compared to the Lisa. Nowadays, things look a bit different, and it can even run Linux on our ARM Mac, but that's like, well, 40 years later, I guess. So, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope Apple tries to invent the personal computer again. And if not, we're going to do it based on the Lisa, right? Uh, so I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for listening. And here's a lot of references that are probably hard to read, but of course, we'll publish the slides later on if you want to dig deeper. And of course, if you have questions, ask no, now or later, or just get in touch. Thanks a lot.